so welcome back uh, very good evening so i was going through all the messages after the class was over on the last day and uh, uh, in the last week we have finished uh, cvs now as you can see we are going according to our democratic rights we are going according to our majority and majority of people they have asked me cns to start cns now cns is one of the most deliberate thing one of the most delicate and difficult aspect of physiology in fact as a horizontal integration we must know cns as per or according to or along with neuroanatomy so i hope most of you do have idea of neuroanatomy by this time with as you are doing your anatomy classes so there will be some kind of integration will be required today i will discuss how cns has to be approached to gain maximum possible marks with minimal input and maximum amount of concept in cns in physiology but remember two aspects of learning cns in physiology first of all you should have a good knowledge of cns anatomy in case if you don't have it i will suggest you to attend anatomy classes videos go through books and even after that if you don't understand it or if you have certain queries get back to me i will try to make it integrated as much as possible now cns is the central nervous system and cns physiology or neurophysiology has broadly two functions or broadly two classification there are two classifications one is you need to know about brain and spinal cord this is important brain and spinal cord and the other is spatial senses so these are two things that you need to know in cns so in brain and spinal cord certain things you need to understand first of all the higher functions the higher functions is dealt up with brain so our brain deals with thinking logic spelling thought our paranoia our panic our happiness desire you know desire to uh, desire for bodily function desire for food our thirst our temperature control everything body balance a major portion of body balance everything is dealt up with brain and in higher function mostly we do deal with our thinking our sorrow our basic emotional pain and our sleep our sleeping pattern and also clinical neurophysiology which is very important called eeg that we shall deal with it in spinal cord two things we will think of in uh, neurophysiology one is ascending pathway the other is descending pathway ascending pathway it has a particular meaning ascending pathway takes or you know collect responses from the periphery and then it goes back to the spinal cord and from spinal cord it ascends to brain so ascending pathway deals with sensory modalities whereas descending pathway is your thought one thought has come to you like i am thinking that i shall write right now or i am thinking that i will be speaking right now so a thought has come on higher center from there it will come down to spinal cord and from there it will basically go to the peripheral muscles if we need to talk it the impulses will come to my peripheral muscles which is tongue which is my voice box larynx which is my lips which is my oral muscles facial muscles which helps in articulation of words if i think of writing this will come to my peripheral muscles of hand peripheral muscles of fingers peripheral muscles of body so this are two major issue ascending pathway and descending pathway ladies and gentlemen just be very calm over here and try to concentrate on whatever i am right now dealing with or i am right now discussing because after this discussion i will also again summarize the basic nature of basic structure of neurophysiology syllabus remember neurophysiology is just like mathematics there is nothing to fear about it simply go through the structure dissect the structure connect it with your anatomical knowledge make a horizontal aggregation you will be a master in neurophysiology there are two more very important aspect of neurophysiology one is theoretical aspect 
If you have a very fantastic idea of neurophysiology, you will save 20 hours. You will save 20 hours on the last week before you go for medicine exam in your final prof. That is very important because with a weak base of neurophysiology, it will be very difficult and deadly to attend the neurology section of medicine. But if you have a proper idea of neurophysiology, like the reflexes, if you know, like the ascending pathway, you know, like the, you know, brown secret syndrome or all these things, we shall discuss everything. If you know by this time in your first year, it will be a piece of cake work on your final year examination. So remember this, the second is, Having a good idea of neurophysiology will make you or will keep you ahead of the lot in clinics. Just by, you know, uh, just by checking some reflexes or just by checking the tone and power of a particular limb, you can or you will be able to perfectly delineate the lesion in brain even without looking at the CT scan. So that's the beauty of neurophysiology and obviously neurophysiology is not alone. You have to learn it simultaneously with neuroanatomy so my sincere request to all of you as this class will proceed simultaneously attend the anatomy videos simultaneously attend the anatomy classes and go through anatomy book so that you can get a mental association and connection and remember in today's class also i shall discuss memory and physiology regarding memory and if you can take that properly if you can memorize my memory section your memory will be better so that that is again another benefit of attending today's class so before we move on i just give you an overview of neurophysiology what you need to do it will be a little bit of a summary. So basically two things. One is brain and spinal cord. In brain, we have to deal with the higher things like thought, like talk, like speech, like smell, all this in brain, like so many other things also there. In spinal cord, you need to learn about tracts of which the ascending tracts are for sensory modality ascending tracts that take peripheral senses and they take it up to the brain and there we get all the delineation and the descending tract is for the motor modality you think over here and it comes to the periphery so that's that's all and coming to the spatial senses we have five spatial senses that you need to know one is vision the second is our auditory sensation the third is our you know uh, gustation without taste fourth is uh, your touch and also fifth is smell in in various order so this five things you need to understand so today we shall start from the top we shall start from the top that is higher function and cerebral hemisphere and after that we will move into sleep we will move into eeg we will move into memory we will move into learning if time permits let's begin so first of all there are two hemispheres in brain one is right hemisphere the other is left hemisphere but there is one term that is known as the dominance cerebral hemispherical dominance what is dominance like i am a right hander so technically in majority of right handers their left hemisphere is dominant and in majority of left hander their right hemisphere is dominant so that is the very peculiar thing first of all but remember this dominant hemisphere or non-dominant hemisphere can said has been changed over the last few decades and nowadays we just call it categorical hemisphere and representational hemisphere remember students from this higher function what you will mostly get are short notes tables and differences and explain why so we will in your first prof examination so we will move in that direction only so first we'll go as it comes in exam as uh, we can you know if we go like this we'll have an input output balance you have to you know go through uh, less for less duration but you will get a better input and definitely you will get a better output so first we'll start with categorical hemisphere and representational hemisphere so i will urge you people to write simultaneously so that you know you can utilize this time in a better way so categorical categorical hemisphere erstwhile it was known as dominant 
and then we have representational representational hemisphere so we representational hemisphere now i think you can see representational hemisphere so previously we we'll we used to call it non dominant basically so it is non dominant dominant non dominant okay so let us go through it in a tabular form so categorical hemisphere what are its functions suppose if you are a right hander your categorical will mostly be left side left hemisphere so its function is language that is very important language spoken words written words all these are the function of categorical hemisphere so both both of this spoken plus written so if a person is a good orator that means if he is a good speaker so his categorical hemisphere must be highly functional that's very important and if you keep on practicing speeches you if you if you want to score good marks in your viva your categorical hemisphere should be exercised okay this is number 1 second is calculation this is very important mathematical skill calculation 2 plus 2 it will be very easy 200 into 200 it will be a little bit difficult so there are people who have fantastic categorical hemispherical capability so they don't even require a calculator for even you know bigger maths problem solution so this is number 2 and the third word is analytics so analytics or analytical ability that is also a part of category that is also a function of categorical hemisphere so for a right hander mostly his left side left hemisphere should be well developed for analysis logical analysis of you know a solution or a, or a problem so basically if we look at subjects categorical hemisphere deals with science maths commerce and definitely speaking clear so scientific skills your mathematical skills all depends on this if we come to representational hemisphere there are certain changes what are those first is representational hemisphere gives us a spatial orientation the idea the idea of a 3d object or idea of a 3d space that is you know delineated by the representational hemisphere second is our facial recognition to remember people's face there are many times as we age what what we can see that our fish uh, I, i can i can particularly uh, you know recognize a person by his face but i i just forgot his name so all these there's there's a there's a disbalance between the connection between these two representational hemisphere and categorical hemisphere as we age so anyway so facial recognition is the second thing Th third thing is artistic ability you can say music you can say painting everything depends on the representational hemisphere number 4 is the 3d ability already i have discussed 3d ability like the pilot pilot fighter plane pilot jet pilot they must have a fantastic representational hemisphere otherwise they can't understand the depth the distance the actual 3d distance between two moving object in the similar direction or in the opposite direction for this they must have a particular 3d orientation which is delineated by representational hemisphere and the fifth one very important that is imagination imagination so representational hemisphere is the hemisphere for poets for the philosopher so that is representational hemisphere you understand so let us just go through once again categorical hemisphere as as the class will move on we will speed up but right now just go through once again so that never ever in the future you forget about anything not to forget this you must have a proper balance between representational and categorical so categorical deals with language 
It deals with spoken and written language. It deals with oration, deals with calculation, maths, science, commerce, and analytical ability, logic. Very important. Whereas representational deals with emotions, spatial orientation, facial recognition, artistic ability, musical ability, you know, imagination, our insight, our insight regarding a disease that is also comes around, you know, comes in case of representational uh, hemisphere. So this, this table you must know by your heart. Once this table is done, we will move on to the clinical physiology or clinical aspect. So clinical aspect is if there is a lesion, if suppose there is a lesion of a particular hemisphere, suppose there is a lesion which is affecting the left hemisphere, what will happen? And suppose there is a lesion which is affecting the right hemisphere, what will happen? So that's the clinical aspect. See, clinical aspect, if there is a lesion in left hemisphere or categorical hemisphere, I'm telling about left, taking that majority of people are right handers just by taking that okay so if there is this what will happen there will be aphasia what is aphasia aphasia is paucity of speech lack of speech lack of words that is aphasia so there will be aphasia and there will be dyscalculia or acalculia. As the name suggests, you can understand that there is a problem with calculating ability. So dyscalculia is the deficiency of the calculating ability or acalculia that is complete absence of calculating ability, calculation ability. So this too can happen in case of this. Now, if we come to the representation, I think you have already uh, written that. So we are moving forward. If it comes around the representational hemisphere, so what will be there? First, there will be astereognosis. Astereognosis. Take your time. New terms. Representational hemisphere. Lesion in representational hemisphere. Lesion in representational hemisphere. Suppose. So. I'm just focusing it, I'm just centering it, lesion in representational hemisphere. So first thing is astereognosis. So what is stereognosis? Stereognosis is also known as haptics. I think some of you may be aware of the uh, software haptic or some of you may be aware of the haptic surgery. So basically what is haptics? Haptics is suppose if I, if I touch, suppose I am closing my eyes and I'm touching a hand I'm touching an object and I am understanding just by touch its texture its depth its consistency this ability to understand by touching ability to understand ability to have an uh, ability to create a 3d map in our brain is known as stereognosis so if lesion is there in representational hemisphere, there will be astereognosis. There will be low ability or a low ability to understand the 3D texture of a thing, of a substance. Then there will be, you know, agraphia. Agraphia. Inability to, you know, identify a concept and make it express through words make it express through writing that is agraphia then there will be agnosia agnosia is inability to process a sensory input that you will not understand your brain will not be able to process a sensory input now what is it Sup what is the difference? Suppose if your sensory modality over here is deficient, you will not get the modality. Suppose there is pain, but you don't understand there is pain because sensory modality over here is not acting. But that is not agnosia. Your pathway from here to here, the ascending pathway is perfect. But even after that, you can't understand because your brain cannot process the information brain cannot process the sensory information this is known as agnosia which we find in case of lesion in representational hemisphere then there is very interesting thing it is known as a unilateral neglect neglect means suppose if your if your representational sorry uh, yes representational hemisphere is not working 
your body or your brain will not be able to process informations coming from the other side. So this is very fantastic. See, normally what happens, suppose you are seeing a person. Two scenario to make you understand what is neglect. First of all, a person is walking and a person is walking and you see, normally when we walk, we do not bump into things. If we bump into things, that means we have some problem with either our legs or our eyes or our, I mean the vision or something well in our brain or in our body. The, that's the thing. Now suppose if you move on and or if the person is moving on and continuously suppose his left side is bumping into things, then there are only two possibility. Either there are some peripheral disease, that means suppose he can't see due to some visual problem, he can't see the left side. So every time he moves, he is bumping into hard objects and he is getting pain and all these things. That's one possibility. The second possibility is that his muscles are okay, his ascending and descending tracts are okay, his cerebellum is okay, his basal ganglia is okay, his vision is perfect. Even after that, he is continuously bumping. It means there's a neglect. His representational hemisphere can't process any sensory input that is coming from that side. So for the brain, only the half of body exists. The other half doesn't exist. So this is known as unilateral neglect. Very interesting, but it is seen in representational hemispherical lesion. And you know, and also there will be loss of artistic ability. Definitely a person cannot used to sing well, but he has lost his singing capacity, music skill, you know, used to draw well, he has lost his, that, lost his drawing capacity. So loss of artistic ability and loss of facial recognition, definitely. These are basically 2 plus 2, 4. Uh, already we have discussed a loss of facial recognition and ultimately loss of 3D orientation, loss of 3D orientation. So all these things. So video game, video games, we need a good uh, level of uh, representational hemispherical ability. And if you play video games, graphics games or games which deals with 3D things. So in that case of simulator games, it will help you uh, develop your representational hemisphere. But I do not promote, ladies and gentlemen, I am not promoting video games over here uh, during your study times. So you do it in your, you know, uh, times in your recess. So that's a different thing. So let's just summarize astereognosis. So uh, uh, then agraphia, then agnosia, then unilateral neglect, loss of artistic ability, loss of facial recognition, loss of 3D orientation. That's it. So basically, astereognosis means with no processing of sensory information. So the actual texture of a thing we cannot understand. Agraphia, we cannot, you know, uh, write properly. We cannot find out a concept. We cannot understand and process a concept and then express it in words. Then uh, music and art awareness is going uh, away. That's another thing. Then agnosia is the unilateral neglect. I have already discussed in great detail and other things already we have discussed. So this is the hemispherical distribution. Once again, remember this is very important as short note. Now we will move into the next part, which is... Uh, I have seen every alternate year has come. This is EEG. This is electroencephalograph. So electroencephalograph, EEG. What is this? Basically, uh, it it is the recording of electrical activity of brain, where we put electrodes on various designated spaces on scalp and after that we can get a report of brain function or you know brain dysfunction whatsoever so basically what is electroencephalograph recording of electrical let me let me make it center recording of electrical activity of brain where actually we use it we use it there are certain clinical aspects 
So uh, before that, let me tell, uh, let me write. Uh, placing, it is recorded by placing electrodes on various areas over various areas over scalp. So these are the two things. So various areas over scalp, you just put it and um, you can get electro encephalograph. Got it? Okay. Now we'll move on. Now we'll move on. Okay. So first is this. Then clinical aspect or clinical benefits or clinical indications where we actually prescribe EEG. First of all, suppose sleep disorder. There we can prescribe EEG, sleep disorder. Okay. Then we can prescribe EEG in seizure disorder. I, I think 50% of you know what seizure is. For the rest, let me tell you, seizure is convulsion, hysteria. Seizure is a kind of a disease. You, you have seen this kind of, you know, a person convulses and he uh, may lose his consciousness or may not lose his consciousness. This, this convulsive disorder is known as the seizure disorder. And this is due to uh, certain hyper excitability of neurons in brain or maybe due to some focal neurology issue seizure disorder can occur but seizure disorder for that definitely EEG is mandatory to first of all diagnose it and then classify it because it will help treatment lines to be decided on the basis of that okay so sleep disorder then seizure disorder and then various physiological studies various physiological studies then you know as a lie detector sometimes we can use okay then also neurologically determine brain date there also we require um, you know EEG so these are the things that we must go through okay these are the uh, requirement of easy uh, so there are other requirements also research activity particularly or some drug trial we can use EEG but more or less from your first year point of view this much you need to know now you move on to various EEG waves this is extremely important again remember this is this table will give you good marks help you good marks in exam because short notes and um, small uh, you know the sub part of a broad question will come from this zone okay so various waves of ecg various waves of ecg i'm sorry eg i'm sorry eg various waves of eg okay so eg waves are an they have a particular nomenclature like all other physiological uh, things they have a nomenclature their names or their waves are denoted by greek alphabets alpha beta gamma delta theta mu lambda like that this waves are denoted of which i will i will uh, write quite a few waves simultaneously i will urge you people to write the waves name of the waves their frequency their source and their function this much only you need to remember if you go through simultaneously if you write along with me you will have a good revision of the thing so waves first of all we will find the alpha waves so basically alpha waves it we find alpha waves is the most prominent wave and normally alpha wave happens when we are awake we are you know we are quiet we are awake we are quiet and not very tense so this is the time when we get alpha wave and remember we have our eyes closed this is extremely important so kind of uh, you were you know resting in an uh, on an easy chair and um, you you have your eyes closed your minds are wandering here and there but there is no tension no stress normally on your mind so then we'll get this alpha wave the frequency of alpha wave is 8 to 14 or at some book says 8 to 13 hertz. This is the frequency. What is hertz basically? Hertz is cycle per second. That's the wave frequency. Remember one thing. 
if the frequency is high, the amplitude of the wave will be low. So, it's, a, it's just the inverse relation between frequency and amplitude. If you go through any textbook, you can find all the amplitude of all the waves. But remember, only the frequency you need to remember for securing a mark. So, it should not burden your head with the amplitude. Okay. So, generally 2200, you know, microvolt is the amplitude of alpha wave. But generally, you will not be asked about this. Okay. And alpha wave basically the location of alpha wave is mostly in the central and temporal region. So, location of alpha wave is central and temporal region of our brain. So, these are the few things you need to remember. What is that? That alpha, just remember few things over here. See, name of the wave you need to remember. Awake state, quiet, eyes closed, not very tense. These four things you need to remember. Its frequency you need to remember, and the location you need to remember. These are the four things you need to remember. Just take your time, and we'll move on after that. I'm giving you thirty seconds. The people who are writing and finishing it. Meanwhile, let me see. For the people who have joined later on, uh, let me tell you that. There are chat window options in the DNA app, and there you can directly on real time you can reach me, and I can you can send me your doubts, you can send me your questions. Okay, so yes, Dr. Shumana asked about. Is there any inverse relation? Definitely, there is inverse relation between uh, the amplitude and mm, mm, you. I, I mean, I think you asked about this one. Just now, I have discussed that amplitude and uh, the frequency. They are just the opposite. If you have a high frequency wave, you have a low amplitude thing. Low amplitude. Um, uh, mm, high frequency means low amplitude. So that that's the basic thing. Now we are moving to the beta. Beta wave is the second wave in the zone so beta wave and the beta wave frequency is more than 13 hertz so basically the frequency of beta wave is 13 to 30 13 to 30 hertz is the beta wave frequency so the frequency of beta wave will be more than alpha and that means the amplitude will be less than alpha amplitude will be less than so if alpha wave is this big beta wave will be smaller but their frequency will be higher. Understood? Okay. So, location. Location of beta wave is fronto, central part of the brain where we can find the beta wave. When beta wave is seen, basically, alert, awake, and eyes open. So, the moment you open your eyes, there is a conversion between alpha to beta. If you are alert, awake, eyes open and attentive. These four things must be there for a beta wave. Understand? Alpha was there, alert, awake, eyes closed, wondering mind. Now you are moving towards more focus. That means we are getting into the subject. We are studying. First we are thinking about study, alpha wave. Now I have actually opened up my book. And I am going into the study. Just I have started studying beta wave. Because I have to study with my eyes open. I can't study with my eyes closed. Is there anyone who can study eyes closed? Chat, you know, send me your name on, on chat box. But uh, normally what I have seen, nobody can, you know, study eyes closed. Okay, if somebody is studying eyes closed, mostly he is sleeping. And we also will discuss sleep physiology after the break today. Okay, and then what we have? After this, after this, we have the theta rhythm. So, we have theta rhythm. What is theta rhythm? Theta rhythm is 4 to 8 hertz. 4 to 8 hertz. And the location of theta rhythm is parietal and temporal regions. 
parietal and temporal regions. When they are found? They are found during emotional stress. They are found during emotional stress. They are found during anger. They are found during frustration. So, you have opened the book and you have started studying, but you cannot concentrate. Theta. So, three situations right now. First of all, and one more thing, since it has low frequency, it must be having high amplitude. So, first of all, you are thinking uh, about studying and you have no stress. Alpha, you opened your eyes, you opened your book, beta, you are frustrated because you cannot read, that is theta. Then we move into delta rhythm. Two ways we can write delta. This is also this is. So, delta rhythm. Remember, delta rhythm has very low frequency. Its frequency is less than 3.5 hertz. That means its amplitude will be very high, just the opposite, inverse relation. So, delta rhythm happens in very deep sleep. Very deep sleep. Delta rhythm happens in organic brain injury. Delta rhythm happens in organic brain injury. And delta rhythm happens in infants who has a developing brain. So these are the three systems when delta rhythm can happen. And delta rhythm can also happen, you know, in coma. Also delta rhythm can be found. So what happens? Now you are frustrated. And after getting frustrated, you just sleep off. That today, no. Today I can't study. So I will just sleep. So then again, delta rhythm can appear. So alpha, beta, theta, delta we have got. So this is for the bad students. Now we are coming to the good students. Good students, they get into alpha, beta and they get into gamma rhythm for the good student. Good, gamma. Gamma, good. Okay. So gamma rhythm is a very high frequency, very high frequency rhythm. So very good marks. Understood? So it is a 30 to 80 hertz or 30 to some book says 30 to 100 hertz. Both are correct. That's the frequency of gamma rhythm. It happens when we have intense focus. Intense focus. I don't know how many of you right now have intense focus. But I really pray that, pray to God that if you have intense focus, you will remember all this. So gamma rhythm will help you memorize a content, memorize a subject very well, very quickly. That is gamma rhythm. So this is one second place, second situation where we have found gamma rhythm in deep meditation. Also, we have found gamma rhythm. So, so far we have discussed about five waves. Alpha, once again, I'm, I'm just sitting on easy chair. I have nothing to worry and I'm thinking that I will study. I am a medical student, I am in lockdown, so I think of study. It's a lazy th thought, alpha rhythm. I open up my eyes, I open up my books, beta rhythm. I am a good student, I can focus on study, I go into gamma rhythm and I memorize. I am not so good student, then I cannot focus on study, I get frustrated. No, nahi parenge, but chodo ye. So then we go get into the theta rhythm. I am a good student, I get very tired. I am a bad student, I get very frustrated whatsoever. Both need sleep, so I sleep and I get delta rhythm. So for this many rhythms we have done. So there are certain uh, other rhythms also. One important rhythm that I uh, will like all of you to remember, one is the, that is the breached rhythm. Breached rhythm is... Normally what happens, it's a slightly different. So suppose, uh, I think some of you have gone through EEG in your childhood due to some diseases. So maybe you have seen in your lab or you may have seen on, uh, on any sources you can see. So basically what happens, we put the electrodes on different uh, zone of scalp. And remember that we do on intact scalp. So whatever potential differences we are recording, we are recording it from beneath the intact scalp. That means scalp is acting as an insulator because we are recording potential from neurons which are present beneath the scalp in the brain. Now suppose there is a road traffic accident. There is some kind of accident, some kind of trauma to your scalp or the skull and it is opened up 
brain is being seen skull is breached in that case what will happen the insulator layer between the exterior and interior are or is breached is deficient so the waves will have greater amplitude because the resistance will fall down so breached rhythm this is the eg when skull and scalp layer is breached so that's the rhythm when skull or scalp layer is breached remember so this is also sometimes asked in viva and we have some other rhythm like mu like lambda so just remember this rhythms about this rhythms but not much you know like lambda we found in occipital zone lambda we found in occipital zone and you know mu we find during thought of a movement but for uh, from the point of view of first prof um, just having the idea that lambda uh, wave is there or mu wave is there will be sufficient just to write this to mu wave we find in motor cortex uh, during thought of a movement and lambda we normally find due to visual um, activity in the occipital zone so these two things i think if you write will be sufficient and extremely important at the end of eg in a different orientation actually uh, the father of eg is hans berger or hans berger so he is the father of eg again again a small um, you know a short i mean one mark question or five this is very important this is the inventor of eg hans berger okay william enthoven was the inventor of ecg Hans Berger is the inventor of EEG. Remember? So EEG was invented in MACD, McDonald's, Burger. So you will never forget. And I hope you will never forget about the waves because if you if you remember the, uh, you know, the simulation that I have just now used, opening books, closing books, you know, thinking about study, getting frustrated, going to sleep and focusing. So all this about this uh, EEG. Now after EEG we'll go to very interesting topic. The only national pastime right now in lockdown after FB, Facebook, sleep. Extremely important. There's a new, you know, new medicine uh, or new stream of medicine which is still evolving is the sleep medicine it's a separate stream of medicine that is basically getting evolved nowadays and remember lot of diseases physiologically or psychologically lot of diseases in our body it is somehow what connected with sleep and its disturbances so here in this class today you will have to learn about the basic idea of sleep okay so so first we'll move on to sleeps and its types so basically before we move on sleep and its types a few important aspect i need to tell you first of all we sleep in cycles and the cycles are like that mostly the cycles are a 90 minute cycles 75 to 80 percent of this 90 minute is the non-rapid eye movement sleep and the last you know 10 percent 12 percent 15 percent 20 percent the minority part of it is the rapid eye movement sleep in the non rapid eye movement sleep this is the beginning phase of the sleep and rapid eye movement sleep that is the ending phase of the sleep once a rapid eye movement sleep has happened it's like this it's a cycle you can see it's a cycle and interestingly the major part of this cycle is non rapid eye movement so this is n r e m and the minor part of this cycle is the rapid eye movement and mostly one major one n rem plus one rem it is of 90 minutes so after every 90 minute cycle brain has to choose between two options of an mcq these two option a uh, options are 
whether it will wake up or whether it will go into the next cycle. So normally at night of uninhibited sleep, we basically sleep for four to six cycles, depending on things. Right now, I, I have few students who can even sleep for 10 cycles or 12 cycles, but they are superhumans. We, we should not think they have super physiology, but we have to think about the normal people, normal physiology. So 90 minute cycle. So mostly after 90 minutes, either we will go into another 90 minute cycle or awakening. So if you look at this statement, the thing that comes from this statement is that when we wake up, we basically wake up from this zone. That means from rapid eye REM sleep, rapid eye movement sleep. From there, we basically wake up. Now, in REM sleep, that's the suppose this is the, um, uh, let me draw it on an, on a linear platform. Suppose this, this zone was in REM, it's the initiator point. And this second zone is the REM. Okay, so this is the point one when we just sleep. So this initial part, it will be light sleep, then it will be a little deeper sleep, and then it will be very deep sleep. And after that, it will be a different kind of sleep. Understood? Now, in this zone, normally dreams do not occur. Even if it occurs, we cannot remember. However, in this zone, dreams occur and mostly, mostly we can remember those dreams. So dreams, if someone asks you, occur in which, which zone or which uh, phase of sleep, answer will be the REM sleep. Non-REM sleep, non-rapid eye movement sleep, dreams may occur, but we mostly cannot remember. So before we move on, we now go into a table which will make things cl clarified for you and I will urge you to write what I am writing right now. So these are the stages of sleep. Again, remember, this is a question. This question can appear, you know, in exam like stages of sleep, regulation of sleep, and parasomnias or the sleep disturbances. So I will go one after another. So stages of sleep. So normally, if we look at, there are two classification. One is recent classification or new classification. And the second is old classification. Then I can write about the percentage of total time devoted or total sleep time and the characteristics characteristics so these are the four you know let me focus yes i think now you can see i'm keeping it over here now you can see so recent classification is n1 n2 and n3 old classification was stage 1 stage 2 and n3 was divided into stage 3 and stage 4 this we are talking about non rapid eye movement sleep non rapid eye movement sleep i think you can see right now okay so the initial stage 1 was less than 5% of total sleep time the second stage was approximately 50% of total sleep time and the third stage was approximately 10 to 20% of total sleep time. That's the total sleep time. Remember, all this constitutes approximately 80% of total sleep time. Rest is constituted by the rapid eye movement sleep. By that way you can calculate. Now regarding the, you know, regarding the characteristics, so let us let us go a little down so that you can understand so the first stage first stage characteristics is high frequency waves definitely there will be 
high frequency waves on EEG because high frequency wave is a characteristics of awake state. Now, N1 is the state, it is the interface between awakening and falling asleep. So, the highest frequency waves are possible in N1 only, and high frequency wave means there will be low amplitude waves. After that, in N2, there will be moderate frequency slip spindles will be generated on EEG. Slip spindles are specific types of waves which are found in N2 or the second stage of NREM sleep on EEG. Slip spindle, they have 10 to 14 hertz, you know, 10 to 14 hertz of uh, frequency it means they are very close to alpha waves and we also find k spikes or k complexes they are also another type of uh, eeg waves which we find on n2 or second stage in case of stage 3 what do we find we find continuously lower frequency stage 3 continuously lower frequency continuously higher amplitude and in stage 4 we find delta wave that is the let let me let me make it over here yes stage 4 we find delta wave i think you can see i can even see now okay let me move a little aside so that you can write now it's i think it's clear for you yeah, so slip spindles and K complexes we find in this stage 2 and stage 3 is, you know, it is, uh, it, and the feature, characteristic feature of stage 3 is the frequency is getting lower and lower and the amplitude is getting higher and higher and delta wave is there. So that's the stages of sleep. This is calling about the NREM slip. Okay, got it? Take your time. Take your time. Okay. So let me check in between if there is any further question has come. Okay. So after this, we'll move on to the REM slip. REM slip is the rapid eye movement slip. Rapid eye movement slip is the REM slip. So where we actually, when we find the REM slip, REM slip is found after the in REM slip, basically. So what is REM state? In REM sleep, there are certain changes that occur in our body. Like there will be rapid eye movement due to increase tone of extraocular muscle. Rapid eye movement due to Increase tone of extraocular muscle, increase diaphragmatic tone, increase blood flow to genitalia, that's why there is a chance of erection. female genital activity there is an increase blood flow in female genital activity or female genital zone there's a chance of increase chance of dreams and awakening happens in REM sleep the 
uh, EEG wave that we find, basically the EEG wave that we find in REM sleep is more high frequency, more like beta-like waves. So mostly beta-like waves, this is extremely important, so beta-like waves are seen in REM sleep. Now this is very paradoxical. See, beta-like waves are basically seen during awakening, when you are alert. But again, in a type of sleep it is being seen. That's why REM sleep is known as paradoxical sleep. So what do we find from here, once again, see, after NREM, NREM there were lot of, you know, areas of NREM, first NREM, there were stages of NREM, after NREM there were REM sleep, rapid eye movement sleep, where normally the body muscle tone falls down, but specific muscle tone gets up, like the muscle tone in extraocular muscle. Suppose most of the time you have seen your friends or your colleagues or your relatives at home, your parents, your brother, sister, dad, they are sleeping and their eyes are moving. This is the period of REM sleep. Their eyes are slightly open. This is the period of eye REM sleep. And in several um, local spaces, certain ideas or certain colloquial terms are being used suppose whenever your eyes move our parents used to say that we are dreaming somehow if even they do not know it scientifically this is more or less correct because whenever your eyes moves that means eyeballs moves your extraocular muscle tone is higher and most probably you are in the REM sleep and already i have discussed that dreams we see mostly in REM sleep. Mostly. It is not mandatory that dreams cannot be seen in REM sleep. But whether dreams, we, I mean all the dreams that we see in REM sleep, there is a high chance that we can remember those. That means we can only remember those dreams which we see in the REM sleep. And more dreams are seen in the REM sleep. So this extraocular muscle movement is there. Second is diaphragmatic movement is the mode. So there's a chance of high breathing activity, high respiratory activity. Third is genitalia, blood flow to genitalia, vascular smooth muscles, they are acting more. So there's a chance of erection, penile tumulants, all this. So an awakening that also happens from this REM zone. Five, the most important question that sometimes come that, you know, why REM sleep or what is paradoxical sleep or why REM sleep is known as paradoxical sleep. This is very important university question. It's very important even for the university. So paradoxical sleep is the rapid eye movement sleep. Basically what happens? The beta wave or beta like waves are seen in this kind of sleep. But we know that beta like wave is only seen or beta like waves are mostly seen in awake state. But still it is seen in a type of sleep. In sleep if we find awake EEG then it becomes paradoxical. So that's the thing. So with this right now we are taking a short break we'll be coming back with all the answers of the questions and the further classification of sleep after the break thank you uh, break so we have a lot of questions over here first of all many of you have asked um, like yogita dr yogita dr krishna chaitanya dr shorkar and quite a few have asked us about uh, what is agraphia agraphia is See, first the issue is inability to write or formulate written words. That's the thing. You can't write. But there's a, there's a very big issue that you cannot process a concept. So, suppose I am writing. Suppose I am writing a word. So, I need to have an understanding of this. Understanding. I'm not talking about memory. The processing. Processing of the complex understanding of anything and then expressing this in a written language this is a graphia yeah. that's that's the thing that if you suppose i have a pen right now and i don't have any so inputs are coming i can see this is wide this is long and this is i am holding i can see everything but i cannot process this 
inside me and I cannot generate the word to write what it is. So if you ask me what is it, I cannot write. A normal person can write. This is a pen. I cannot write if you have a graphia. And this happens when I have a lesion on right hemisphere. Then there are other questions like uh, sleepwalking, sleep talking, all these, you know, uh, we will um, discuss just as the class will progress. It's a part of our class today. It's a part of our class. But where we can find here uh, certain, yes, Dr. Vishnu Dashmande, Kishore. Okay, Kishore asked me, is it Kishore? Yes, Kishore asked me. Delta rhythm in which region? See, these are not region specific. It can find from every part of brain. This is the face specific. So delta rhythm we find when we are in deep sleep. Dr. Sharkar asked me what is organic brain injury? That means injury to the organ as a whole. Now suppose I, I um, you know, express this word organic brain injury and then we find delta wave. That means if there is some serious brain disease then that is known as well i mean injury to brain as an organ or injury to the organ that's organic brain or maybe some developmental problem in brain that is also in some books are expressed as organic brain injury okay then gamma rhythm in which region again it is focus specific it can be found in most of the but frontal Sometimes, sometimes in hippocampus, we can find gamma region. In hippocampus, during deep meditation, we can find gamma region. This is mostly frontal and other parts also depending on your intense focus. See, like occipital zone, occipital zone, you know, we, we look at things, we, uh, um, uh, occipital zone deals with vision. So, intense visual activity, we can find some. Uh, you know gamma waves but again lambda waves also come over there so mainly you for your first year hippocampus frontal depending on the focus what is agraphia a lot of people have asked uh, some other questions so how, how this waveforms look like see waveforms are simple if the amplitude is high it will look like this is the frequency is high it will look like this depending on them it will it will just just to go through any normal eg um, report you can find basically if the amplitude is high and frequency is low it will look like this if the amplitude is low and frequency is high then it will look like this just depending on that and in the in in the spectrum actually bruxism i, I will discuss what is epilepsy, Dr. Krishna Chaitanya? See, epilepsy is a disease. Uh, if you can't understand right now, there's no problem because it's 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 uh, it's a higher class thing basically. So epilepsy is a disease. It's a convulsive disease. I think uh, the best is um, if you can see a patient. Like, have you ever seen a patient of epilepsy? I think most of you have seen patient. People who have seen patients of epilepsy, you can chat back to me. Uh, epilepsy is a convulsive disorder where the person sometimes get uh, lo losses his consciousness and there is convulsion on on uh, all over his body or a particular body parts depending on that we call it simple or partial or you know um, uh, complex all all types of things are there so basically it's a brain disorder and where a person may lose his consciousness and there is violent shaking of body that's all for your present understanding I think most of the questions that we have uh, discussed, rest I shall discuss as the time will continue. So now again, important, come back to, uh, from your question, coming back to the university question. So first, this table is extremely important. Whatever we have done so far, this table will summarize. So, and basically, if you just remember this table, it will be enough. Meanwhile, uh, you can also, just like me, it's a home class, so you can also enjoy your tea, coffee, whatsoever, good food, home-cooked food at the same time. That's the beauty of this live telecast. So the first of all, um, REM sleep. So duration. Duration of REM sleep will be 75 to 80% of total sleep. So I will urge you to continuously write because I have to move this page on because a lot of points are there. 
and this is 25 20 to 25 percent of total sleep duration this is the REM in REM is 75 to 20 80 percent then we are coming from brain function brain function so brain function is decreased during NREM sleep and brain function increases in particular motor and sensory region in particular motor and sensory region in REM sleep because that's why there is high extraocular muscle activity eye movement diaphragm movement or you know uh, sexual activity during the REM sleep brain function now we are coming to autonomic function and what are this autonomic function autonomic functions are uh, heart rate blood pressure these all are the autonomic respiration these are the autonomic function so autonomic functions are also low in in REM sleep but this can increase in REM sleep that's the variation once again all this basically uh, gives us uh, an idea of why REM sleep should be called a paradoxical sleep after autonomic function we are coming to the sympathetic nerve activity sympathetic nerve activity sympathetic nerve activity is below wakefulness in case of in REM sleep and it is high in REM sleep that means your muscle tone or your heart muscle tone uh, your respiratory rate your heart rate anotropy chronotropy everything will be high in case of REM sleep then we are coming to the muscle tone muscle tone is basically same as awake muscle tone muscle tone is down except few muscles already we have explained except few muscles in uh, REM sleep and temperature 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 is the there is a thermostat in hypothalamus once we will go into hypothalamus you will understand so basically temperature is or thermostat is set at low temperature thermostat is set at low temperature and here there is no regulation of thermostat no regulation of thermostat temperature in REM sleep depends on local temperature or peripheral temperature okay now we are coming to you know arousal this arousal means whether you can be awakened from the sleep so arousal occurs less frequently REM sleep arousal occurs frequently okay EEG low frequency waves seen in REM sleep higher frequency waves seen in in REM sleep so low frequency waves are seen in in REM sleep and higher frequency wave seen in REM sleep. So there is one particular thing that is seen in REM sleep which you need to remember that is the PGO spike. This is Pondo Geniculo Occipital. So what is this pondogeniculo occipital? There are EEG spikes in pons, lateral geniculate body,
and occipital lobe. These are the three places where there will be EEG spikes in REM sleep. I will give you some time to you know write it properly. And I think this is enough for you uh, for uh, first prof. Take your time and also ask me if you have any query. extremely important this one because uh, in exam you can find it as a seven mark question um, five to seven different marking I have seen there is a you know difference differentiate between Raymond and Raymond slip also a lot of questions might come as a sub part or as a you know fraction of this table See, arousal are two things. One is increased sexual activity, but that happens in REM sleep. Dr. Krishna Chaitanya has asked that here arousal means awakening. See, awakening, infrequent awakening happens in case of NREM sleep, whereas in REM sleep, frequent awakening happens. Just what I have mentioned in the beginning with that diagram that this is the initiation of sleep, this is the ending of NREM. This is the REM and from here either you go to the next cycle or you get awake. So frequent arousal or frequent awakening happens from in, in from the REM sleep. That's, that's all about this. Now we are moving to, I think you have done this. So we are moving to the next part. I will give you a particular table, table of content which will help you to go through a lot of pay pages in the exam actually a lot of questions in the exam so there are certain things we will see in books it is very complexly written uh, in a very complex way it is written I will give you a simple diagram simple table it will help you out see so this is neurophysiology of slip neurophysiology of slip or genesis of slip you need to know about uh, the substances that promote slip and substances that inhibit slip in brain and the area that promotes slip and area that inhibits slip in brain so sleep promoters and sleep inhibitors Slip promoters, slip inhibitors. So slip promoters, number one is lateral hypothalamus. Lateral hypothalamus. Just you need to know the names. And the neurotransmitter coming from lateral hypothalamus is orexin. Slip promoter number two, raphenucleus. And neurotransmitter that comes out of it is serotonin. Slip promoter number three is reticular activating system. This is another RAS. Reticular activating system. And it is norepinephrine, NE. And the last one is posterior hypothalamus posterior hypothalamus it is histamine so these are the slip promoting area okay Okay, so we move on. Now, 
we are coming to the next part that is slip promoter one one moment this this i need to change this is wakefulness promoter this is wakefulness promoter and this is now we are coming to the slip promoter slip promoter there's a change simply okay so first is slip center at hypothalamus slip center at hypothalamus it is the pre optic nucleus pre optic nucleus don't get confused first this one it was we are issuing a cutting and demo over here this is the wakefulness promoter zone the first one and this is the slip promoter zone in slip promoter this is the slip center at hypothalamus so first is the pre optic nucleus the second is basal forebrain area basal forebrain area here the nucleus or here the neurotransmitter is acetylcholine and the third extremely important is the pineal gland here the neurotransmitter is melatonin so let me summarize let me summarize about this one okay so first is this is wakefulness promoter or sleep inhibitors lateral hypothalamus orexin it will keep you awake serotonin it will keep you awake nor epinephrine it will keep you awake and histamine it will keep you awake and sleep promoter it will fill you, it will make you sleepy pre optic nucleus and basal forebrain area acetylcholine and pineal gland this is melatonin remember melatonin all you know in all of this melatonin is connected or associated associated with circadian rhythm circadian rhythm and day night cycle day night cycle so melatonin is associated with circadian rhythm and day night cycle understood so this is all about the sleep physiology or genesis of sleep or neurophysiology of sleep if someone just asks you uh, that uh, you know what is the neurophysiological basis so you just write like this that neurophysiological basis of sleep is still under research but there are certain areas and neurotransmitters that we have understood sleep rhythm is dependent on the circadian rhythm of the day night cycle and these are the following brain structures and neurotransmitter which actually regulates the sleep of which wakefulness is regulated by the lateral hypothalamus raphe nucleus reticular activating system of the ras this is the brain ras is not the kidney ras something different and posterior hypothalamus and slip promoter this zone is dip, you know by again by hypothalamus basal forebrain and the pineal gland so this this is the slip thing now we are coming to the next thing which someone asked me a little while earlier see just a moment so if someone asked me a little while earlier is the parasomnias okay so these are parasomnias what are parasomnia parasomnia are disturbances in sleep disturbances or disorders of sleep so krishna chaitanya and other people have asked me about various parasomnia like bruxism let me check what are your questions role of melatonin see role of melatonin melatonin actually makes you sleepy depending on 
it, it's, it is secreted from pineal gland. There's a connection between retino and suprachiasmatic nucleus and hypothalamus and pineal gland in the day-night cycle regulation, Dr. Thoeb. And whenever, you know, there is decrease in light, uh, you know, melatonin will be secreted more and it will be more sleepy. That's it. And there is also one interesting thing nowadays. A lot of people, uh, they... Uh, you know, suffer from the insomnia or the lack of sleep. Uh, the major reason of because uh, behind that lack of sleep is uses of a lot of white light. This media, phone, laptop, pad, etc. During night time, because the blue light that emits from here keeps your brain busy and makes your brain think that it is still daytime. So pineal gland is not activated, melatonin is not secreted, and sleep is not induced. So again, for a better habit, whenever you go to sleep, keep all these gadgets away from you so that your pineal gland knows that it is a night time and melatonin comes out. Hope I have answered your query here. Okay, so parasomnia or sleep disorder, these are also very interesting and we can, you know, divide them into either in REM sleep disorder and REM sleep disorder. So we are going to the in REM sleep disorders. Parasomnia. So in REM sleep disorder first is we are coming to sleep walking. Someone has asked me about sleep walking. The, the sleep walking, I'm keeping it in the center. Okay. Sleep walking, it is a name. Name is somnambulism. Somnambulism. It is found in NREM stage 3 or stage 4. Person may walk. Person may walk. In, uh, and he can go out of bed and go out of the you know room and may go elsewhere without having the knowledge that he is actually working. So this is somnambulism. At times, somnambulism can occur. There's a chance that somnambulism can occur also in REM sleep. So there's a chance somnambulism can occur in REM sleep too. The second is somniloquy. So what is somniloquy? Somniloki, look at the spelling. Somniloki is sleep talking. I think most of us do. Most of us do sleep talking. And that is actually in the stage one and stage two of NREM sleep. Stage one and stage two of NREM sleep is somniloki. The third is bruxism. Someone has asked me, bruxism is teeth grinding like this. So bruxism is teeth grinding, very common very common friction between teeth it is involuntary during sleep so it happens stage one and stage two of in rem sleep there's a chance it may occur also in rem sleep bruxism and the fourth we can have nocturnal aneurysis nocturnal aneurysis and this can happen in stage three stage two of or stage 4 of in REM sleep and also it may happen in REM sleep nocturnal aneurysis and we have night terrors tremendous uh, fear during night time and with its autonomic you know expression like you know excessive heartbeat sweating tremendous respiration all this so night terror that also can in 2 to 4, stage 2 to 4 of NREM slip. So these are uh, the parasomnias of NREM slip mostly. In REM slip, REM slip disorder, REM slip disorder, one is narcolepsy. Again, extremely important. Narcolepsy means excessive sleepiness during daytime. So excessive sleepiness during daytime that is narcolepsy so it, it is a disorder of REM sleep and we have nightmares there is a difference between nightmares and night terrors nightmares are bad horrible horrorful dreams that you can remember so dreams that you can remember that happen in REM sleep so nightmares are 
in the REM sleep. Night terrors may be due to dream, may not be due to dream and mostly you cannot remember the dream which is, which is the cause of night terrors because that happens in, in REM sleep. The difference between nightmare and night terror is night terror is more, more and more autonomic whereas nightmare is more and more emotional. This to a difference. So your activity, your expression will be more emotional in case of nightmares. And secondly, dreams, bad dreams of nightmares you can remember because it happens in REM sleep. So with this, we have finished uh, the sleep disorder part uh, and the sleep and this part is over. We are just having a short two minute break over here and after that directly we will come and we will get into the learning and memory. Meanwhile, if you have any query, you can send it. In two minutes, we are coming back. <clears throat> In REM sleep disorder, so it is on your screen. Uh, some, and some of some others like Dr. Dhiraj Varma and this. Krishna Chaitanya, uh, they have asked me about um, enuresis. Enuresis is, you know, involuntary micturition, urine passage during sleep. That's the basic thing. Urine passage, involuntary. We all have this experience when we are children. Also, in uh, aged people, it can happen. So, the, in, that is nocturnal enuresis, this one. Okay, so this may happen in stage 2, 3, 4, or sometimes may happen in REM. Okay, Dr. Nilesh. Has asked me which one is more emotional, night terror, nightmare. See, night terror, it is in NREM. Okay, so this is more autonomic. This is more autonomic response, less emotional response. And nightmare, this is in REM. This is more emotional response. Here, emotion causes autonomic response, whereas in night terror, autonomic response causes emotional response. So, if I have to ask, answer you that which one is more emotional, nightmare is more emotional. Now, we have to quickly move into our next zone that is learning and memory. And I think it will be very happy learning. Now, learning and memory. So, what is learning? Learning is Learning is acquiring or getting new information. So learning is acquiring, acquiring new information. That is learning. And what is memory? Memory is retaining or retention of that information. Retention of that information. So today what we are doing? Learning. What we have to do for exam? Memory. But what we are doing right now, acquiring new information. It is our learning. And what we have to do in, mem in examination, we have to memorize, we have to written, commit, vomit in the examination. That is memory. Okay. Now, we have to know about memory. What are the classification of memory? Very important and very confusing also. So, let me clarify your confusion so it so memory remains in your memory forever okay so two way to classify memory one way memorize this two way to classify memory so one way to classify memory is by its types the other by its duration how long you are holding the memory on the basis of that duration memory is classified and on the basis of what kind of memory this is, on the basis of types memory is classified. So two types of memory. Memory, two types. So one is explicit memory. Explicit, I shall explain. First you write explicit memory. Explicit memory has another name. The name is declarative memory. The other is implicit memory. Implicit memory has a name that is non declarative memory explicit is declarative implicit is non declarative what is the basic difference explicit memory it requires you know an awareness so what it requires it requires awareness implicit memory it deals with skills 
it deals with reflexes so it doesn't require an awareness let me explain explicit memory is all about facts numbers events so for explicit or non -declar explicit or declarative memory you have to remember the name of your book and when you are memorizing you are memorizing like this that this is the book book x book y book z you need to remember this implicit memory is learning to do a surgery is learning to play cricket is learning to run a ride a bicycle there you need not to remember that this is the way this is the angle when i uh, the it is the angle where i have to hold the bat it is the angle where i have to do the back lift that means you need to know this as a muscle memory you need to know this but you need not memorize the 30 degree angle after this then 4 degree drift over there 7 degree drift over there this you need not remember once again let me make it easier for you by a game of cricket explicit memory deals with the name cricket you have to memorize the name cricket and it is by your explicit memory implicit memory deals with the playing actual there you need not know the name of a shot to learn a shot if you remember this is cover drive that comes in your or that goes into your explicit memory but how to create how to uh, you know beat a cover drive how to drive a cover drive make a shot of cover drive that is your implicit memory because by looking at a drive you can say it's a cover drive because you know by your explicit but when you are playing a cover drive your muscle knows your body center of gravity suppose it shifts your head goes down your front foot goes forward all these things sequentially happen at a subconscious level you do not voluntarily do it subconsciously this happen your body goes towards the ball bat goes towards the ball front foot goes front back foot takes a proper balancing position all this you need not memorize but you have to learn at a subconscious level and that is called skill and that is by the non-declarative or implicit memory that is the basic so if you know there are 11 players one ball three stumps this side three stumps that side two batsmen two umpires this is explicit memory if you know how to play cricket that is implicit memory okay now we are coming to the further classification explicit can be classified into two way one is for the facts and the other is for the events facts known as semantic memory events known as episodic memory so if you can remember about marriage that is episodic memory if you do multiple marriage and remembers the about the number of total marriage which is illegal then that is semantic memory okay and the location of semantic and episodic mostly the same both are basically stored in hippocampus hippocampus and medial temporal lobe i will give you some time because what i feel that it's a new thing for you so take a little bit of time and complete this explicit and implicit and the division of explicit take 30 seconds to one minute to finish it remember explicit or declarative it requires awareness it requires facts numbers events to be voluntarily and specifically to be remembered facts are called memory fact or fact memories are called semantic memory event memories are called episodic memory and both are actually you know stored in the hippocampus and medial temporal lobe i think it's done yes okay now we are going to the implicit memory now implicit i don't have space so i'm just coming over here and i'm using another separate ink implicit using blue color for implicit so there are lot of memory or lot of types of implicit and you need to know see these are like this 
one is priming the second is procedural of which you can see the skills you can find the habits okay then we have associative learning okay conditioning and we have ultimately non associative learning okay so these are four basic things so let me explain each after uh, every one after another so first we need to know where these are stored and where these are processed priming is happening in neocortex okay procedural can happen in striatum okay now associative learning has two pluses one is emotional learning okay and another is skeletal muscle response so one is emotional response another is skeletal muscle response okay emotional response is found in amygdala and skeletal muscle response is found in skeletal muscle response is found in just a moment yes skeletal muscle response is found in cerebellum so before we move on i think it will be a little bit difficult for you so let me get it step by step so first of all we are classifying implicit memory which is this priming procedural associative learning non associative learning priming happens in neocortex that's a part of cortex okay that's a brain part if you even don't know neuroanatomy you can still remember that it happens in neocortex that's a part of brain what is priming most of you most of us have been through priming what is that suppose in the exam someone has asked you a question last night you have gone through the answer thoroughly but due to exam stress at the venue you cannot remember suppose someone has asked you what is homeostasis so you said sir 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 just first two words just first two words you just tell me and then the sir who is a very kind gentleman he tells you okay homeostasis is oh sir i remember now and you remember and you just vomit the whole definition this is priming a little bit hint if we give to a person and if he can remember the whole thing because the whole thing was associated to that one or two pivotal words that is called priming so most of us most of our bigger data it is kind of a you know uh, that uh, one one smaller file which which is on the desktop and connected to a bigger file it that kind of connection is priming so major things are in the hippocampus and neocortex just having this superficial file if you just give that hint to that person to that student he can remember the whole thing this is priming procedural playing cricket doing an appendicectomy that means appendix operation you know doing a suture doing a suture okay uh, 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 typing all these are procedural and this procedural thing you can learn by by doing you know uh, uh, by the striatal activity coming to the associative learning associative learning is that of pavlov's experiment if you remember so associative what was the pavlov's experiment that was the classical conditioning what was that a dog was there he was kept in uh, uh, you know cage and in that case there was a bell so initially the dog was habituated in such a way 
the scientist used to ring the bell once the bell is rung he was offered a little bit of food the dog after seeing that food he had used to have the vagal response and salivation so there was a cycle bell sound food given salivation so after few days the dog started associating bell sound with food so after few days of habituation when a day comes when the scientist rings the bell but doesn't offer any food even then it was seen that dog has excess salivation this is known as associated learning so there the dogs actually learns to associate the sound with the food okay so this is associated learning and it has an emotional response <coughs> excuse me and it has a skeletal muscle response emotional response means having the food that's a pleasure feeling of pleasure similarly the negative response can also be generated the experiment can be done on monkeys or any experimental animal suppose you ring the bell and you give a electric shock to the monkey or the animal and the monkey will be squeezed the monkey will don't like that he will be angry agitated fearful there will be emotional response also skeletal muscle response that it will try to flee from that so that's known as negative reinforcement so dogs food thing is the positive reinforcement this is the negative reinforcement so these two are associated learning the take home message from associated learning is that there's an association between two events there's an association between two things that we actually learn by this pathway of associated learning and the last one is the non associative learning that is basically by the reflex pathways non associative learnings are those learnings like brendra shrevag he knows how to hit a six in hitting a six there are numerous steps initially he was batting at a standing stance then he takes a back leap then he takes his body backward then he hits it he has a proper bat swing then the bat comes and follow through so and center of gravity moves in the similar fashion he has hand eye coordination so he hits the ball on the right moment at the right with the right timing with the right power so so many things are there and remember he doesn't do it 1 2 3 4 like that writing on a paper he does it subconsciously or unconsciously so it is not done in a conscious manner he only knows that the ball is coming over there i have to hit that is the only conscious thing all other things are happening in a much quicker zone that our consciously we cannot do it is done subconsciously so actually it is done by the reflex pathway by the muscle memory so this is known as the non associative learning so these are the parts of memory that we have discussed so far so if anyone have you have any question okay anyone if you have a question you can send me regarding this then after this we will move into the memory on the basis of time or duration okay so we are going to the memory on the basis of time or duration so there are three types of memory on the basis of duration i got a question from dr yogita that if a person is poor in spellings which hemisphere is affected so there are a lot of way by which it can be answered but remember if he cannot remember spellings if he cannot remember spellings uh, if he cannot remember the words so the left is mostly affected okay if you cannot remember okay procedural and non associative basically procedural and non associative there is very faint uh, you know dr saikirti yeah procedural and non associative there are very faint difference non associative is also a kind of habituation and sensitization whereas procedural is also a kind of skills and habit in procedural at least see you need to have some kind of uh, conscious thinking like if you are doing suppose i take a complex work of doing a gallbladder operation 
now the procedural memory keeps you remembering that you have to wipe the place you have to disinfect the place you have to take the scalpel you have to cut in this zone that's a procedural memory and non associative is or reflex is that suppose suddenly there is some excessive bleeding and your hand immediately goes over there and stops stops the bleeding that is the non associative mostly things are overlapping you cannot differentiate them too keenly or too you know there is there is a very fine line of demarcation between these two kind of in every procedure you have to have a non associative learning think of virendra shewag is playing a, 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 you know in front of shoaib akhtar and suddenly he was having a back lift he was going properly he was doing a fantastic stance and everything that is procedural suddenly a ball become uh, suddenly a stiff bouncer comes suddenly all of a sudden so at the that moment he suddenly takes his head off this is non associative so in this your reflex is more tested are in skills and habits in procedural your cortex is more tested this is very basically you need to have both to um, uh, you know to hone your skills or to have good skill in any activity you need to have both basically now depending on duration we are uh, you know uh, doing this we are classifying the memory so first is the working memory working memory is also known as working memory let me let me first enumerate working memory during on uh, depending on duration second is short term memory short term memory and the third is long term memory so working memory short term memory long term memory these are the three things so working memory is ultra short acting memory ultra short acting ultra short duration it is normally we can have up to 7 plus minus 2 bits of information we can keep in case of working memory what is working memory L suppose you ask your friend about a friend's phone number suppose the phone number is 9878488 like that so you just listen to it once and just by listening to it once you dial the number if it is okay fantastic you talk to the patient talk to the uh, talk to your friend but suppose the number can busy and the second time you again go for dialing the number and now you found find that you cannot remember the number this is working memory so working memory basically deals with less than 10 chunks of information another another example of working memory from your real life in the exam in from the student who is sitting in front of you from him or her you have seen an answer or a diagram and then you just come over and you are trying to draw this at the same time the examiner has come he asked you what you are doing you said nothing i am not doing anything sir and the examiner said okay good boy do it he left and now you you discover that memory is also gone you just don't remember anything whatever you have seen so actually whatever you have seen it it was you know stored in the it was stored in the working memory and when you are going to again um, reproduce that you are unable to do that basically okay so this is working memory which is ultra short acting now short term memory short term memory working memory basically remains there for 20 seconds short term memory remains for minutes to hours or sometimes for a day short term memory is processed in hippocampus mainly short term memory helps you before your anatomy exam the last night you are reading mugging through all the anatomy books whatever information you can cram you are cramming that is your short term memory if anatomy exam is postponed by 2 days and if you don't study after 2 days if you go to give the exam go to sit for the exam in that case you will find that you remember less than 40 30 40% whatever you have crammed two days back but if it happens on the proper day at that day basically then you will find that you remember mostly 70 80% so this is basically short term memory and long term memory is the processed memory so long term memory remains there for days to years sometimes it can remain there for 
a lifetime. So long term memory is there for days to years and sometimes it can be there for a lifetime. Okay. So very important thing over here is that that how we can convert short term memory to long term memory. That's the important thing over here. So short term memory and this is also uh, the lifeline for us medicos. We have to know how we can convert short term memory to long term memory. Everything depends on this. Everything. So short term memory to long term memory. How we can do this. See. So this process of condensation of memory and conversion of short term into long term is known as synaptic plasticity. Remember this term synaptic plasticity. This is very important. What is this? This is change in the strength of synaptic connection. Change in the strength of synaptic connection. This is known as synaptic plasticity. Just a little bit basic of synaptic plasticity or synapse. Let us just draw a little bit basics. Normally, this is the presynaptic knob. This is the postsynaptic knob. If you can remember, this is actually from neuromuscular physiology or numb muscle physiology. I think you remember this. And presynaptic now they have certain neurotransmitters neurotransmitters it can be glutamate it can be gaba depending on this neurotransmitter there will be epsp or ipsp psp is excitatory postsynaptic potential and rpsp is inhibitory postsynaptic potential depending on this epsp and ipsp will be there now these neurotransmitters they are released and they will be captured by the postsynaptic receptors. So these are the receptors who are present on the postsynaptic membrane. So these are the receptors who are present on the postsynaptic membrane. Once these receptors catch them, there will be influx or efflux of ions which will develop postsynaptic potential which will develop postsynaptic potential this postsynaptic potential once it reaches the action hillock it will develop action potential and once it develops action potential the particular neurological function will be observed got it same is for memory and what is the difference of synaptic plasticity? What is the peculiarity of synaptic plasticity then? If you revise a topic, if you repeat a task, if you habituate yourself with something, in that case, more and more synapses will be involved in doing that. <coughs> more and more neurotransmitter will be present and released from presynapses for doing that more and more receptors will be expressed on express means receptor availability on membrane normally these receptors are also present in the cytosol and due to genetic expression and depending on the demand supply these receptors are ultimately expressed on the membranes as these receptors are expressed on the membranes more and more receptor and neurotransmitter connections will be formed which means there is a chance of more easy generation of psp and subsequently ap subsequently improved and increased function same is for any kind of habit so synaptic plasticity actually gives us an idea of elastic capacity of brain in terms of its function it's not in terms of your compression or size or something like that it's not structural it's in terms of function if you play cricket for years your synapses your nerves that actually helps in motor recognition you know uh, seeing the ball hand eye coordination everything they will go through synaptic plasticity and their 
activity level, their superiority level will increase. Opposite is true also. If you don't do something for a long time, you will forget to do that. So students, synaptic plasticity is the savior at the end of the day. You have to go through all the materials, you have to go through classes, you have to repeatedly revise all the topics, only then your synaptic plasticity develop more and more long term memory. Otherwise, you will just be one day wonder or a few 20 seconds wonder in the exam. The result is not good in that case. Now, synaptic plasticity, there are five ways by which synaptic plasticity is normally seen and we will just enumerate these five ways today. And in the next day class, we will start from here and after that we will move into the motor physiology. Before that, also I will, ex I will ask you to go through neuroanatomy once and have an idea of spinal cord structure. I will also provide you spinal cord structure on the day two, next day when we will move into the motor, motor physiology. But before that, if you go through spinal cord structure a little bit, it will be easier for you. And also a little bit about the brain structure like what is cerebellum, what is cerebrum, what is basal ganglia, which one is thalamus, which one is hypothalamus, which one is medulla, which one is brainstem. This, this much you need to just know from your anatomy textbook. So today, the last thing, this is the neural basis of memory. Neural basis of memory, I will explain it in the beginning of the next class. So neural basis of memory. This is the basis is the synaptic plasticity. And basically there are three ways by which synaptic plasticity uh, actually helps. Increases memory, there are three ways. And decreases memory, there are two ways. So number one is post titanic potentiation post titanic potentiation number two is sensitization sensitization and number three is long-term potentiation long-term potentiation these are the ways by which potentiation by which synaptic plasticity is increased and memory is increased and video screen mirroring so uh, we are back again uh, so um, yes class is not over so, so see memory uh, i was discussing about the synaptic plasticity there are three parts uh, three ways by which synaptic plasticity increases memory. One is post-titanic potentiation, the second is sensitization, and the third is long-term potentiation. And memory is decreased by two ways, basically. One is long-term depression, long-term depression, and it is number one, this that this decreases synaptic plasticity, and the second is habituation. Habituation. So before we move on, uh, before we end this class, let me just summarize the whole thing that has happened today. We have started CNS and in CNS there are certain things we need to remember. One is the higher function, our thought, our desire, thinking, insight, imagination, 3D orientation, facial recognition. All these are done by our cortex, our brain and our sensory pathways, that means the ascending pathway, pain, temperature, vibration, everything we sense on our hands, limbs, legs, back, everywhere and that comes to the spinal cord and from there it ascends up to the brain, so ascending path pathway and then it comes back to the descending pathway where we think of something and then we can move the spin. So I think of a movement and that this happens. So a thought is converted into action potential that goes to the nerve you know, of the spinal cord, from there it goes to the hand muscle muscle or from there it goes to the leg muscle periphery that is the descending pathway. So this descending pathway depends you know deals with the motor physiology and ascending pathway deals with the sensory physiology. So descending pathway we will start the next day but today what we have done we have done the sleep we have done the EEG in sleep we have discussed about the non-rapid eye movement sleep which is the basic 75 to 80 percent of sleep and then the rapid eye movement sleep which is also known as the paradoxical sleep because many physiological parameters in that paradoxical sleep actually so you know is similar to the 
wakefulness activity or electrophysiological activity that happens in wakefulness. So these two differences are there. After that, what we have done? We have done the EEG and the inventor of EEG was Hans Berger and there are various waves of EEG where higher frequency gives to the lower amplitude waves and their location, their frequency and their uh, you know mm, uh, and their uh, timings everything we have discussed after that we started learning and memory where memory we have classified it into two ways basically uh, and one is uh, depending on the uh, uh, types of memory where implicit and explicit was discussed event memory episodic memory semantic memory of explicit and uh, you know programming procedural priming associated learning non-associated learning we discussed from implicit so all this we have discussed over there and after that we have come to the synaptic plasticity which is actually the key to improve memory or decrease memory and there are few ways few neurological ways by which synaptic plasticity happens one is the post titanic potentiation then there is sensitization there is long-term potentiation and also memory can decrease on the basis of you know long-term depression or habituation so we are closing this class today over here uh, next day we'll start from the detailed physiological discussion from here and after that we will move into motor physiology before that my advice to you will be just have an idea of the various brain parts and lobes the spinal cord and spinal cord cross-sectional anatomy before we move into motor physiology post motor physiology the day after we will find we will uh, do or in the next to next class we will do somatosensory physiology after that we will get into the visual and um, auditory system of the special senses so with this um, let me tell you that um, we need to bid goodbye good night uh, for this let me know how you uh, are liking the class is there anything that you want to convey uh, anything uh, about the uh, conceptual clarity or anything about the question discussion anything about the doubt clearing or the speed of the class if you like the class let me know i am all, i am available on the chat box so i am waiting for your reply and for all all your doubts also you can contact over there in the next class i can i can just uh, you know explain those doubts and clear your doubts so with this i hope it was was a very useful learning session you can find me uh, in this live session every week um, basically and we are highly experienced in this uh, about the new uh, competency based curriculum and we will definitely guide you how to write the exam how to balance your input and output and how to get better marks in the exam with the least amount of stress and regarding memory i think you have learned a lot about memory today i think that uh, following this class will actually improve your performance in the exam so thank you and good night goodbye for today for this week meeting you next week with